one of the main ingredients in your recipe is like the participants you are going to involve. Of course, this assumes that you first precisely define uh, your target population. The main questions here are what's the sampling strategy and how to reach and select end users. Ideally, the best sampling strategy is probability sampling. That's a process that gives all the individuals in the population equal chances of being selected. The advantage of this random sample is the absence of both systematic and sampling bias. So if random selection was done properly, the sample is therefore representative of the entire population under study. But in the reality, that's not something you can achieve uh, in UX studies. And typically, you would use opportunistic sampling strategy, where the availability of participants on the will guide uh, your sampling. And this induces the risk of sampling biases. Despite not using a randomized process, it's therefore important to ensure that the sample is representative. The sample size varies in different research settings, and it's therefore quite impossible to give numbers here. But very often, people ask for numbers, and they want to know how much uh, people they should involve. Uh, of course, all else being equal, large sized sample leads to increased precision in estimates of various uh, parameters of the situation. Having a representative sample is probably the part of the recipe where you cannot truly make compromises. You better have a smaller sample but representative than a larger that does not target your population. And that's one of the dangers about guerrilla method, for instance. It obviously saves its resources. It's fast and cheap to hang out in a public place and ask people to use your product in exchange for coffee. But it's only a reasonable option for a very limited set of research objectives. The main issue uh, with guerrilla research is that you're not targeting your end users. Uh, I've often heard that guerrilla research is better than no research. And for certain questions, I disagree. Uh, just because you will run the risk to be, of being confident about invalid findings. Another ingredient, your research design. A good cooker is the one that will be able to reduce the number of research biases. So research bias is the distortion of results by a confounding variable, but by something that you didn't want to measure. A bias can occur at any phase of research, including study design, data collection, as well as the process of data analysis and the sampling also. And there is no way we can completely avoid biases, so we just have to accept them. But we have to be aware of them so that we can reduce the level of biases in our research and then increase the validity and reliability of all findings. So here are only a few examples of research biases, but they are like much more than that, uh, with some ways of avoiding them. Uh, the first one, so selection bias, um, happens when one relevant group of the population has a higher probability of being included in your sample. Uh, to avoid that, you might choose a random or representative sample, sampling strategy. The experimental or interviewer bias refers to the fact that different treatment of participants may affect the outcome of a study. So for instance, if you do not have the same style of welcoming each participant, or if you're talking a bit more with one participant before an experiment or before an interview than you're talking with another, then you're biasing the results. And having standardized procedures and instruction is the best way to avoid this bias. Uh, the expectancy or observer bias refers to the fact that the researcher's expectations affect the outcome of a study. So having independent observers and computing inter-rater agreement might be an option to avoid this one. And the last example, the social desirability bias. Uh, this one is well known. It refers to the tendency of respondents to answer questions in a manner that will be viewed favorably by others. And one solution um, is the careful formulation of questions and items. And we might also use projective techniques. I'm going to show an example. Last but not least, uh, using mixed methods can tremendously increase the quality of your research conclusions because you're triangulating the data. And to do so, uh, we need to combine both quantitative and qualitative methods. Some objectives are best suited for one type of research over the other. However, if you want to get a full picture of your user experience, you need to understand what's happening and why.
So if you only have quantitative data, you may be missing out on key insights that could make all the difference in your understanding of user experience and make sure you're solving a problem that actually needs solving. Uh, on the other hand, if you only do qualitative research, you won't be able to tell whether your findings are representative of a larger population because you will have a smaller sample size and you will not be able to generalize the results. And that's why the best research strategies incorporate both approaches. Combining qualitative and quantitative data seems obviously more time consuming and costly, but let me give you just a last quick example of how to do this without a lot of resources. In a recent study about electronic reading experiences, we tested a cost-effective method to gather both quantitative and qualitative data through an online survey. So to do so, we included a sentence completion task in a remote online survey to collect both quantitative and qualitative data. So the sentence completion method consists of incomplete sentences which are given to the respondents to fill in the missing words. It's a very easy and uh, yet promis promising way of understanding users' needs and experiences when the resources are limited. So here are the unfinished sentences that we've used in our, well, the translated one because the study was in French, um, that we've used in our study. The sentences were designed so that they would gather data widely from different aspects of the experience. So as you can see, we do have uh, like the global user experience, but we also kind of trigger um, answers about expectations and needs, effects, issues and frustrations and so on. For some dimension, uh, we choose to have two sentences instead of one in order to see whether we would collect more data or whether participants would express redundant information. So this is the case for the dimension issues and frustration uh, where we had uh, the problem with e-books is and what frustrates me most with a digital book is. So we do not have time to go through all the results, but let's look at this. Um, on the left, you can see that we had a seven points Likert scale about the overall reading experience. So we asked the people on the seven points Likert scale, how would you rate your overall e-reading experience? And that's the result. Um, as you can see, they assess their overall reading experience as mainly positive, with about 80% of answers between five and seven on the Likert scale. So the interesting thing here is that from a UX design point of view, there is not much we can do with such an answer. I mean. It could even induce us to believe that there is no problem to solve, nothing to improve. However, when using the sentence completion task, we see a different picture of the situation. Uh, we, for instance, analyze the results um, to the, that sentence, the reading experience on a digital book is, and we classified the, the words according to the, the valence, positive, negative, or neutral. And as you can see here, we found out that about 64% of the answers were positive, which is already less than the 80% collected through the Likert scale. And here, we just have a few examples of categories of issues identified during the analysis of the sentence. The problem with ebooks is. And as you can see, we collected in depth information. So the problem with ebooks is the price, the lack of availability and choice, the bad quality, the bad read, the impossibility to lend the book to a friend, the digital rights management, the bad reading experience, and so on and so on. Um, in only a week, we had 1,800 participants in our sample. And beyond the identification of the main issues by counting the occurrences of each category, the answer might also be used as a basis for idea generation. Uh, so for instance, a surpri surprisingly common answer was, um, I cannot physically track my progress in the book. And this was perceived as both disturbing from a navigational viewpoint, but also as less motivating than a paper book. Because you can feel that there are only a few pages left in your paper book. And this would encourage you to read until the end of the chapter, which does not happen with an electronic book. Some participants also talked about the fact that with e-reading devices, we cannot see the book cover anymore. So it appeared that many participants liked spying on their neighbor in the public transportation services. And they were like, it was like both a way to show up their identity, but also to collect some reading ideas here and there. 
Um, and so all these kind of uh, user stories, experience stories, uh, might truly be used for, for like generating new ideas. And you can also see, uh, prioritize them because uh, the sample size is so large and, and the data analysis was less time consuming than, than uh, open-ended question, for instance. And for all the people who already have included open-ended question in a survey, uh, then you know that the, the completion rate is so low because like, it's boring for the participants to answer those questions.